Welcome to the Conversations with Jesus podcast. I'm Johnny Lehman, a baptized man of God who has the amazing privileges of being a husband, father, and the pastor at Divine Savior Church in West Palm Beach, Florida. This podcast is designed to bring you the self-sacrificing love of Jesus found in the Bible through 15 to 20 minute episodes that focus on relevant life issues and what God has to say about them. Check out our website, DivineSaviorChurch.com, as well as our Facebook and Instagram pages to find out more about the incredible things God is doing through our church family. I'm a little bit giddy this week because we're starting a brand new podcast series over the next 10 weeks called, Are You Sure That's What It Means? And I think you're going to find this series to be especially engaging as we look at 10 misapplied Bible passages, putting them back in context and seeing them as they're designed to be seen. Because the reality is, Bible passages, they're written so that we understand God more, right? They're not written to just find our own meaning in it or try to make something of it. They're not. The intent of the Bible as a whole is to point us back to Jesus, point us back to God's promises. And so over the next 10 weeks, We're going to look at that. We're going to kind of practice this. How do I know what a Bible passage is actually saying? We're going to learn how to look at the context and find the biblical meaning that God would have us know to bring us closer and closer to him. And so the first passage we're going to look at is Proverbs 22, verse 6. Maybe you've heard this one before, seen it on a greeting card, Christian artwork. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. It almost seems like a mathematical formula, right? That if you teach your children the word of God and they're young, without question, you will see them in heaven. If your child your child loses their faith at some point, they will come back without a doubt. Unfortunately, that's not what Solomon is saying in Proverbs 22. Of course, by all means, baptize your children, teach them the word of God starting when they are young, but recognize that although it's not an absolute promise from God that our children will persevere in, in the faith until the end, it is his wisdom that all Christian parents will want us or will want to follow. And so I'm really excited to unpack this with you. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Let me say it one more time. Train up in the child, a child, in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not turn from it. This is the word of our God. If I made a list of the top 10 ways to spark an argument, this question would definitely be towards the top. What is the best way to parent? Maybe you're snickering right now. The amount of, I mean, just think about this. The amount of parenting techniques, parenting advice, parenting theories honestly makes me want to throw a temper tantrum myself. For example, on Amazon alone, if you search parenting books, over 60 thousand results come up it shows how complex parenting can be knowing what to do how to do it when to do it and it's very apparent on social media the amount of parent shaming parent blaming and parent acclaiming that's out there the subject of parenting can be a bit of a hot mess but here's the good news friends by god's grace our heavenly father has the wisdom and clarity parents seek That's why the book of Proverbs was written. God wants to guide parents to love their children, reflecting him, and for children to experience God's love through their parents, which is why it's amazing to me how Solomon sums up what Christian parenting is truly all about in one verse. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, This verse has often been been misunderstood, which of course is why it's starting this new podcast series, right? We're looking at these passages in the Bible where many have missed the real meaning. Now, take a minute or 20 seconds or whatever, and just think on, totally on your own, for what you think the meaning of this passage is. So train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And maybe... You're taking it like this. If I parent my kids right, they will never leave the faith. 
Or the flip side, my kids aren't close to Jesus anymore. Clearly, I failed as a parent. Or my kids are still close to Jesus. I must have done a pretty good job. None of these are hitting what Solomon is driving at. Notice where the focus is. I, right? Parent-centric parenting, which is simply not how God designed raising children to be. But this leads us to ask ourselves, what is the real reason why parenting can be so difficult? Or if you're a child, what is behind the struggle of listening to our parents? It's because often the conversation surrounding parenting is dominated by the concept of control. Whether you're the parent, whether you're the child, control affects everything. Just think about it. When as a parent you feel out of control, it affects how you view yourself, doesn't it? Your own identity. When you see your child disrespect or disobey you, is there not self-doubt in you that just eats you up? When you feel like you've lost control, when it's affecting your perception of yourself, it inevitably will affect how you parent, right? You might become much more quick-tempered. You might be constantly scanning and evaluating to see how others view your parenting ability. You might begin to see your kids as a tool to use for self-validation. And of course, that means it's not only that you are affected by this, but just think with me for a minute. How do you think this affects kids? See, kids experience, when they experience your desire for control, and whether they can verbalize it or not, they start to push back, right? Because, shocking, kids too desire control. It's all part of the disease called sin, all part of that pride we need to repent of every single day. The pride in us, starting in the moment we are but cells in our mother's womb, that wants control over our lives. When kids sense this, when they see this power struggle for control, they'll start to test your boundaries. Why? Because believe it or not, kids long for boundaries. In the book Parenting with Love and Logic, Jim Fay says this, set clear and consistent boundaries to help children feel secure. See, kids want that security and how you parent not only can lead them to feel safe, but it affects their entire worldview. If their worldview consists of constantly striving for control, they miss out on who really is in control of their identity, of their purpose, of their future, right? Because who is in the driver's seat when it comes to parenting and growing up? You know. See, training up children begins and ends with understanding who they belong to. You know, in worship this week at Divine Savior, we're going to sing a song called, I Am Not My Own. And there's this beautiful verse in there that says this, And if he has redeemed me, I am not my own. The measure of my worth is his love alone. He declares my standing and he declares my state, so I will know myself by the name he gave. In other words, our children belong to God. He has control over the plans he has for their lives. And even as parents, we are always parented by our Heavenly Father. We never graduate from that. Plus, we have a brother too, don't we? Our brother Jesus, who not only gave his life on the cross to welcome us back into his family, but he longs to equip us to do what Moses talks about in Deuteronomy 6, right? To talk about God with our kids, impressing upon our children the life-changing truth that only God can give, that affects the only absolute truth in the world, that affects everything, how they view themselves, how they view their world. Moses says this, impress them on your children. Talk about them. He's talking about the scriptures. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Jesus is what connects everything we do in life. Because we, through faith, we, through his life, his death, his resurrection, and the beautiful gift of baptism, we don't have to wonder who we are and why we're here, do we? We have identity certainty in Jesus. When you understand his intentionality for you, consumed by grace for your children's well-being and for you yourself. You can see parenting with the right lens, right? And kids, you can see your parents through that Jesus lens too. It's not about how, how can I have control. It's about rejoicing and how I have zero control. My Savior who loves me to the point of dying for me, he has authority over all. And so this is what we're going to do in the rest of this podcast to help us really think through what the gospel means for our parenting, how God's unconditional love, his grace, changes how we view our kids and how we react to our parents. We're going to work through each major stage of development in a child's life and understanding it from a Jesus-centric approach of training our children in the ways of the Lord. So let's start off, right, with infants and toddlers. Now, 
for one thing, we severely underappreciate how amazing these little ones are. For example, I learned through an article probably three or four months ago now or more from the American Psychological Association that before the age of two, babies develop empathy, they develop the ability to make moral judgments, and they have language cognition already in the womb. And more and more scientists are discovering the, just the cognitive depth of infants, even in utero. But of course, these wonderful humans can sometimes be a little challenging, too. Maybe this is just all too real to me with having a six-month-old son. Uh, sometimes babies, they don't always want to take a nap when they're supposed to. They won't eat the mush of green beans that you want them to. You will start to think as I often do. I don't know why they're crying. I can't seem to get through to them. I feel so out of control. Remember, when it comes to training a child, who's really in control? It's intentionally reminding yourself constantly that that little one belongs to Jesus. And what I can control is how I love them. It's intentionally remembering that the Lord cares for that tiny baby just as he cares for you. Now God is using your parenting opportunities to first of all teach you about how truly powerless you are even now so you rely on him and appreciate the joy of building the foundation of Jesus already at this age, right? Because believe it or not, your children, your child's worldview is developed pretty early on in life. In fact, according to researchers from Andrews University, the child's moral compass is fairly determined by the age of nine. I mean, just think about how amazing and also how scary this is. You get to be the first voice in their lives about identity, about sexuality, about life, about relationships. You get to help form the worldview they'll be comparing every other influence they hear for the rest of their lives to. And how awesome is our God that he's given us his word that, like Paul writes, his word that makes us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And study after study shows that parents are the most important spiritual influencers in their child's life, more than double the impact a pastor makes. Again, you may be thinking, I don't feel equipped. Well, fear not. Because remember who's with you. Remember who's in control. Remember, you're not alone. You have resources. You have people, Christians, ready to help in this. And again, it's such a grace thing that we get to bring that voice of Jesus into our kids' lives. Because eventually, you're going to get to that teenage stage. And this is where everybody instantly feels awkward. <laughs> the, the moodiness, the, the questions, the... I'm too cool for you, dad, or I'm too cool for you, mom. But beyond the cultural caricatures of teenagehood, this is an incredible stage of development. According to the National Institutes of Health, the most important psychological and psychosocial changes in puberty and early adolescence are the emergence of abstract thinking, the growing ability of absorbing the perspectives or viewpoints of others, and increased ability of introspection and the development of personal and sexual identity. Long story short, Life gets complicated at this stage, but as complicated as life gets, one truth remains. Teenagers, just like babies, toddlers, and tweens, want boundaries, and they want conversation. Now, if you're a teen listening to this podcast, I'm about to reveal a secret you may have never wanted your parents to know. You ready? Here's the secret. Teens want parents to bring up awkward topics. Seriously, they want you to talk about what Jesus has to say about sexuality, about evolution, about social media, about abortion. They want to know how to react during a breakup. And while non-verbally, they may throw their hands up in the air or stay silent or lash out when you try to inject Jesus into your communication, they still want to hear it, whether they admit it or not. I mean, even still, studies have shown teens long to know boundaries, to know wisdom, to grow in their understanding of life. And that's why it's so worth bringing them to church. Not that you're guilt tri tripping them. Not that it's not that, but joyfully talking about how worship is a non-negotiable because we need to be real about our sins. Number one, confront that struggle, ask for the healing of forgiveness, and be motivated and just excited when we really think about what God's grace means for us. We need to hear the Bible and breathe in that grace of God in word and sacrament so we remember we are not our own, that life doesn't revolve around me, but the God who died for love of me. Because that is training up a child, isn't it? That's constantly planting the seed of the gospel. Because ultimately, as a parent, you will not always be here, this side of heaven, for your kids. 
We want to prepare them to live for Jesus all the days of their lives. And that sets the tone for college and beyond, right? Even as your children become adults, you strive by God's grace to continue having a Jesus-centered intentionality in training up your kids. You bring Jesus into the conversation when they're trying to figure out their next career, whether or not to get married, how to process their anxiety. You pray for opportunities to serve them with the wisdom of Jesus. But I think it's at this point also, it's just so critical to have a direct conversation right now about what to do when you witness your kids drift away from Jesus. And maybe that's the thought that dominates your mind every day. As parents, how can we not have fear that one day our kids will give up their faith? But in that fear, let Jesus speak. He tells us in his word he, that his word will never return empty, right? He tells us that he'll pursue us, leaving the 99 for the one. He tells us, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Again, give up your desire for control and give it all to Jesus. Pray continually, not out of fear or worry, because you know what his grace can do. You know that, yes, even when we feel powerless and you see your kids drifting, and that is so painful. You can only imagine how hard that is. But remember that praying is not useless. If that's all you can do is simply to pray, that's an incredible weapon because we know what our God of grace can do. You know, such thoughts lead me to recall a, just a phenomenal quote from what I consider to be the best parenting book on the market today, outside of the Bible, of course. It's called Parenting by Paul David Tripp. And he writes this. In every moment when you are parenting, you are being parented. In every moment you are called to give grace, you are being given grace. In every moment when you are rescuing and protecting your children, you are being rescued and protected. In every moment when you feel alone, you are anything but alone because God goes with you wherever you go. This is the intentionality of God the Father, how he parents us through the lens of Jesus, how he wants to continue equipping you, training you to become just like him. It reminds me of a story I heard once about a single mom. The story goes like this. Her boyfriend dumped her after he found out she was pregnant. And life for her was at times beyond, just beyond painful. Words couldn't describe just how tragic and difficult her experience in life was. This mom always felt like she was struggling, but wanted her kids to be close to Jesus. And they went through many tough times, many extremely difficult times, times when she felt like a confused failure. But then looking back years later, now as a grandma holding her granddaughter, she realized how she was never alone. That her kids actually had a dad. They always did. Their Heavenly Father, who was always there for them and for her. And that's really where parenting, when parenting, is at its peak. When you see in every moment that your Heavenly Father is there parenting you and equipping you to share His love with the children in your home who ultimately belong to Him. We are not our own, dear friends. That's the good news of the gospel, isn't it? Amen. Again, I, I hope that this sparks some really great conversations either just within yourself internally or just as you talk with other parents or your kids, your grandkids. Just understanding how neat it is, how God designed parenting to be, and the opportunities that we get to have, whether you're a parent or not, with the children God has placed into your life to share his love with them, that they can see a reflection of him through us. And so my prayer for you this week is that you have opportunities to do that, those grace moments. You get to share Jesus, especially with the young ones in your life, that that foundation can be built squarely and firmly on the never-changing truth of God. And until next time, God be with you as you live for him.